Islamic Sharia is complete. It's perfect. Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam had told us propagate from me even if it is one verse. So you are the messenger of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The Quran from cover to cover is a message of peace. Message of and the last and final instruction manual for the human beings, it is the glorious Quran. Our next speaker, Sayyid Zayl Hanan of Grade 7, is a die-hard fan of Dr. Zakir Naik. He aspires to be a full-time Dai and wants to reach out to every nook and corner of the world. His passion for da'wah has led him to do a lot of research on Islam and comparative religion. He has bagged many prizes for his Qirat, English public speaking, and other Islamic competitions. He's good at calligraphy and enjoys reading the Qirat of various Qurah. His never give up attitude is an apt reflection of his caliber and personality. We are living in an era where God has multiple definitions. But some consider God just an illusion. Others consider him in everything. Today, falsehood is a reality. However, the Almighty was one and will remain one. There are millions who are yearning to put this real truth forward, sent by Almighty God. So here we have Sayyid Zayl Hanan of grade 7 to fill the fabrications from actuality. The topic, concept of God, Hinduism and Islam. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah. Wa ala alihi wa ashabihi azmeen. Amma ba'd. Fa'a'udhu billahi min ash-shaytani ghajim. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل يا أهل الكتاب تعالوا إلى كلمة سواء بيننا وبينكم ألا نعبد إلا الله ولا نشرك به شيئا ولا يتخذ بعضنا بعضا أربابا من دون الله فإن تولوا فقولوا اشهدوا بأننا مسلمون رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي ما رسبكتت إلدس and my dear brothers and sisters, I welcome all of you with the Islamic greetings. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May peace, mercy, and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be on all of you. The topic of my talk today is concept of God in Hinduism and Islam. I started my talk by quoting to you a verse from the Quran. From Surah Ali Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 64, which says, Qul ya ahlil kitab, say, O people of the book, Ta'alaw ila kalimatin sawa'im baynana wa baynakum. Come to common terms as between us and you. And which is the first term? Allah na'buda illa Allah. That we worship none but Allah. Wala nushrika bihi shay'a. That we associate no partners with him. That we erect nor lords and patrons other than Allah. But if they turn back, say ye bear witness be anna Muslimun that we at least are Muslims bowing to Allah's will. This verse is the master key for da'wah. Whenever you meet people of different types, People of different religions. What does the Quran say? Ta'alaw ila kalimatin sawa'im baynana wa baynakum. Come to common terms as between us and you. And in order to understand the concept of God in any religion, it is not appropriate to observe what the followers of that religion do. Because many a times, the followers themselves are unaware of what their scriptures speak about the concept of God. So the most appropriate way to understand the concept of God in any religion is to read and understand the authentic sources and sacred scriptures. So let us understand the concept of God in Hinduism in the light of its authentic scriptures, in the light of its authentic sources. Whenever you ask a common Hindu, how many gods does he believe in? Some may say three, some may say ten, some may say a thousand. 
and some may say 33 crores, 330 million. But when you ask a learned Hindu who is well versed with the Hindu scriptures, he will tell you that the Hindu should actually believe and worship only one God. But the common Hindu believes in a philosophy known as pantheism. The common Hindu believes that everything is God. The sun is God. The moon is God. Trees are God. The snakes are God. And the human beings are God. But we Muslims believe that everything is God's. God with an apostrophe S. Everything belongs to God. The sun belongs to God. The moon belongs to God. The tree belongs to God. The snake belongs to God. And the human beings belong to God. So the difference is, the common Hindu believes that everything is God. But we Muslims believe that everything is God. God with an apostrophe S. So the major difference is the apostrophe S. So if we can sort out this difference of the apostrophe S, the Hindus and the Muslims will be united. And how do you do that? As the Quran says, تَعَالَوْا إِلَىٰ كَلِمَةٍ سَوَىٰ إِنْ بَيْنَنَا وَبَيْنَكُمْ Come to common terms as between us and you. And which is the first term? أَلَّا نَعْبُدَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ That we worship none but Allah. So let us understand the concept of God in Hinduism in the light of its sacred scriptures. One of the most sacred scriptures of the Hindus are called as the Upanishads. It is mentioned in the Chandogya Upanishad, chapter number 6, section number 2, verse number 1. Ekam Ivadityam. It is a Sanskrit quotation which means God is only one without a second. It is mentioned in Shvetashvatara Upanishad, chapter number 6, verse number 9. Na kasya kasij janita na charipa. Of that God, there are no parents nor lords. Almighty God has got no mother, no father. Almighty God has got no superior. It is mentioned in Shweta Shwetara Upanishad, chapter number 4, verse number 19. Na tasya pratima asti. Of that God, there is no pratima. Pratima is a Sanskrit word which means an image, an idol, a photograph, a picture, a painting. It is mentioned in Shweta Shwetara Upanishad, chapter number 4. Verse number 20. You cannot see the image of God. The eye cannot comprehend God. And amongst the Hindu scriptures, the most popular and the most widely read book is the Bhagavad Gita. It is mentioned in Bhagavad Gita, chapter number 7, verse number 20. All those whose intelligence has been stolen by material desires, they worship demigods. It is mentioned in Bhagavad Gita, chapter number 10, verse number 3. They know me as the unborn, the beginningless, and the supreme Lord of the worlds. And amongst the Hindu scriptures, the most sacred are the Vedas. It is mentioned in Yajurvid, chapter number 32, verse number 3. Na tasya Of that God, there is no pratima. As I mentioned earlier, Pratima is a Sanskrit word which means an image, an idol, a photograph, a picture, a painting, a sculpture. It is mentioned in Yajurvid, chapter number 40, verse number 8. Shudhama Popvidham, Almighty God is imageless and pure. It is mentioned in Yajurvid, chapter number 40, verse number 9. Andhatma Pravishanti, ye asampudi mupasti. Andhatma means darkness. Pravishanti means entering. Asambhuti means the natural things like fire, water, air, etc. So Yadurved, chapter number 40, verse number 9 says, They are entering darkness, those who worship the Asambhuti, the natural things like fire, water, air, etc. And the verse continues, They are entering more in darkness, those who worship the Asambhuti. The created things like idols, sculptures, chairs, tables, etc. And who says that? Yajurvid, chapter number 40, verse number 9. It is mentioned in Atharvavid, 
Book number 20. Hymn number 58. Mantra number 3. Dev Mahaasi. Verily, great is Almighty God. And amongst the Vedas, the most sacred is the Rig Ved. It is mentioned in Rig Ved. Book number 1. Hymn number 164. Mantra number 46. Ekkam sad viprabuddha vidante. Truth is one. God is one. Sages and saints call him by a variety of names. And the same message is repeated in Rig Ved. Book number 10. Hymn number 114. Mantra number 5. That sages and saintly people call God by a variety of names. There are no less than 33 different attributes given to Almighty God in Rig Ved, book number 2, hymn number 1 alone. Amongst the attributes given to Almighty God in Rig Ved, book number 2, hymn number 1, mantra number 3 is Brahma. Brahma in English means the creator. If you translate it into Arabic, it means Al Khaliq. We Muslims have got no objection if anyone calls God as Al Khaliq or as the creator. But if someone says that Brahma is a God with four heads, on each head is a crown, we Muslims take strong objection to it. And moreover, you are going against Shweta Shwatara Upanishad, chapter number 4, verse number 19, which says, Na tasya pratima asti. Of that God, there is no pratima. There is no image. Another attribute given to Almighty God in Rig Ved, book number 2, hymn number 1, mantra number 3, is Vishnu. Vishnu in English means the cherisher or the sustainer. If you translate it into Arabic, it is somewhat similar to Rabb. We Muslims have got no objection if anyone calls God as the cherisher or the sustainer or as Rabb. But if anyone says that Vishnu is Almighty God with four hands, on his right hand he has the chakra, the discus, on his other hand he has the conch, and he is flying on the bird by the name Garuda, or he is reclining on the bed of snakes, we Muslims take strong objection to it. And moreover, you are going against Yajurveda, chapter number 32, verse number 3, which says, Na tasya pratima asti. Of that God, there is no image. It is mentioned in Rig Ved, book number 8, hymn number 1, mantra number 1. Machidan Vyadvi Sansad. Do not worship anyone but him alone. Praise him alone. It is meant in Rig Ved, book number 6, hymn number 45, mantra number 16. Yeah, Praise him alone. Worship that one God. And the Brahma Sutra of Hinduism is Ekam Brahm, Dvitya Nase, Nahna Nase Kinchan. Bhagwan Eki hai, Dusra Nahi hai, Nahi hai, Nahi hai, Zara bhi Nahi hai. God is only one, not a second, not at all, not at all, not in the least bit. So if you read the Hindu scriptures, you will understand the concept of God in Hinduism. So let us discuss the concept of God in Islam. The best reply any Muslim can give you about the concept of God in Islam is he can quote to you Surah Al-Ikhlas, which is chapter number 112, verse 1 to 4, which says, Say he is Allah, the one and only, Allah, Allah the absolute and eternal. Lam yalid wa lam yulad. He begets not, nor is he begotten. Wa lam yakullahu kufuwan ahad. And there is nothing like unto him. This is a four line definition of Almighty God. Anyone says that so and so entity is God, and he fits into this four line definition of Almighty God, we Muslims have got no objection in accepting that entity as God. This Surat al Ikhlas is the touchstone of theology. Theology comes from the Greek word Theo, which means God, and Logi means study. And touchstone means when you want to buy gold or sell gold, you normally go to a goldsmith. And then he takes your gold and he rubs it against the touchstone. And then with the help of the card which he has, he tells you whether your gold is 18 carat or 22 carat or 24 carat, or it may not be gold at all. Because all that glitters is not gold. So if anyone says that so and so person is, is God, you put him to the test of Surah Al-Ikhlas. If he passes the test, we Muslims have got no objection in accepting that person as God. Also, we Muslims prefer calling Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala 
by the Arabic word Allah instead of the English word God. People ask us, why do you Muslims call him Allah? It is mentioned in Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 110. Say, call upon Allah or call upon Rahman. By whichever name you call upon him, to him belongs the most beautiful names. So we Muslims prefer calling Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by the Arabic word Allah instead of the English word God because a person can play mischief with the English word God. For example, if you add the letter S to God, it becomes God's, which is the plural of God. There is no plural of Allah in Islam. Qul huwallahu ahad. Say is Allah, the one and only. If you add D-E-S-S to God, it becomes Goddess, meaning a female God. There is nothing like male Allah or female Allah in Islam. The moment you add Father to God, it becomes Godfather. Oh, he is my Godfather, He is my Guardian. There is nothing like Allah Father or Allah Abba in Islam. If you add Mother to God, it becomes Godmother. There is nothing like Allah Mother or Allah Ami in Islam. Allah is a unique word. So we Muslims prefer calling Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by the Arabic word Allah instead of the English word God. But when we are speaking to the non-Muslims who may not understand the concept of Allah and they use this word God instead of the Arabic word Allah, we Muslims take no objection to it. But I would like to remind you that the English word God is not the appropriate translation of the Arabic word Allah. Also, most of the religions other than Islam, they believe in a philosophy known as anthropomorphism. They believe that Almighty God took the human form and came to the earth. It is called anthropomorphism. They believe that Almighty God took the human form once. Some even believe that Almighty God took the human form many times. And when you ask these people, they have a very good logic. They say, Almighty God, He is so pure, He is so holy, that He does not understand the shortcomings. He does not understand the difficulties of the human beings. So Almighty God, who is so pure and so holy, He takes the human form and comes to earth to set the rules for the human beings, the do's and the don'ts. On the face of it, it looks like a very good logic. But what I tell these people is, that suppose I manufacture a DVD player. Do I have to become a DVD player to know what is good or what is bad for the DVD player? No. But what do I do instead? I write an instruction manual that if you want to play DVD, insert the DVD and press the play button. If you want to fast forward, press the FF button. If you want to stop, press the stop button. Don't drop it from a height, it will get damaged. Don't immerse it into water, it will get spoiled. So I write an instruction manual. Similarly, but Almighty God, He's the creator of the human beings. He does not have to become a human being to know what is good or what is bad for the human beings. But what does He do instead? He reveals the instruction manual. And the last and final instruction manual for the human beings, it is the glorious Quran. The glorious Quran is the last and final instruction manual for the human beings. The do's and the don'ts for the human beings are mentioned in the Quran. So Almighty God does not become a human being. What does He do? He reveals the instruction manual. And for this, He chooses a man amongst men and He communicates with him on a higher level whom we call as prophets or messengers. And the last and final prophet and messenger of Almighty God is Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Both the scriptures of the Hindus and the Muslims are explicitly in clear terms mentioning that Almighty God is one. He has got no images. He has got no partners. He can never take a human form. Worship Him alone. Yet there are people, as the Quran describes in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 18, as, Summun bukmun amyun fahum la yarji'oon. The deaf, the dumb, the blind, they will not return to the path. And the same message is repeated in Rigved, book number 10, hymn number 71, mantra number 4. They see the word, yet they see not. Some people hear the word, yet they hear not. Both the scriptures of the Hindus and the Muslims, they say that there are a few people who see the word, yet they see not. Who hear the word, yet they hear not. Neither do they understand. 
And also we see most of the religious leaders of most of the major religions, whether it be Islam, Hinduism or Christianity, they prevent their followers from reading their scriptures with understanding. Because if the followers read their scriptures with understanding, they might not be able to get their ulterior benefits. If you want to understand the glorious Quran, the best way is to learn Arabic as a language. If you cannot learn Arabic as a language, read the translation of the glorious Quran in the language you understand the best. And Alhamdulillah, we have the glorious Quran translated into almost all the languages of the world, including Tamil, Alhamdulillah. And it is my humble request to my Hindu brothers and sisters. You learn Sanskrit, go back to your scriptures, go back to your Vedas and realize that God is one. And only then can we Muslims and Hindus come together and build a great Indian nation. With this, I would like to conclude my talk by quoting a verse from the Quran, from Surah Yunus, chapter number 10, verse number 108, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قُلْ يَا أَيُّهَا النَّاسِ قَدْ جَاءَكُمُ الْحَقُّ مِنْ غَبِّكُمْ فَمَنْ اِهْتَدَى فَإِنَّمَا يَهْتَدِي لِنَفْسِهِ وَمَنْ ظَلَّ فَإِنَّمَا يَظِلُّ عَلَيْهَا وَمَا أَنَا عَلَيْكُمْ بِوَكِيلٍ Say, O humankind, truth has arrived from your Lord. So whoever receives guidance, he does it for his own good. And whoever is led astray, he does it at his own loss. I have not been sent as a manager of affairs over you. وَآخِرْ دَعْوَانَا الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ وَالسَّلَامُ عَلَيْكُمْ وَرَحْمَةُ اللَّهِ وَبَرَكَاتُهُ Jazakallah khairan brother said, it was indeed an eye-opener. May Allah give us the ability to recognize the truth and stand by it. Ameen. Ah.